Thank you, Provost Mangelsdorf, for that incredibly kind introduction. And thank you, Chancellor Blank, faculty, senior class officers, honored guests, parents, and of course, the class of 2017. We're thrilled to be here. To be asked to speak to you on this momentous day is a massive honor that the two of us still can't quite believe we've been given. We thought long and hard over what to say because, to be honest, this is a pretty under, uh, intimidating undertaking. I mean, come on, look at this place, the Kohl Center. A lot of incredible moments have happened here. Our first instinct was to dispense with a speech entirely and just shoot free throws. No one graduates until we both hit one. <laughs> but then we decided you guys don't need to be here another four years. There's not a day that goes by where we don't think about Madison and the time we spent here. It's a special place and it's a special school. It's where we found our dreams and decided to follow them. Dreams that seemed crazy at the time, maybe still seem crazy, but something about this place gave us the confidence. There's a spirit here and it's infectious. That's what makes it so special to be back. Our friendship and our career started just a few blocks from here. That's where we had our meet cute. In movies and television, when a couple meets and falls in love or starts a lifelong creative partnership, it's called a meet cute meaning that the way they meet is generally constructed to be funny and charming. Think Harry meeting Sally on a cross-country road trip where they argued endlessly before inevitably falling in love. Or Meredith Grey having a one-night stand with McDreamy, then discovering he's the doctor she'll be learning from. Or Emma Stone honking at Ryan Gosling in a fit of rage in La La Land. Or Eddie and Adam meeting in the basement of Vilas Hall. Yeah, we had our meet queue just a few blocks from here in Vilas Hall in Communication Arts 355 Intro to Film Production. One unit in the class had us filming and editing Super 8 movies on a moviola. Yes, films used to be made on actual film, not digital. It was a Saturday in Vilas Hall. I was working on my masterpiece. It was pretentious, and I couldn't wait to see it come together. So I threaded it up. I flicked the switch, and I ran it and my masterpiece was upside down. So I turned to the guy next to me and I said, hey, is your machine broken too? So I looked at him and I couldn't quite believe it. Then I leaned over and gently flipped his film. Eddie had threaded it backwards and with a flick of a wrist, I had solved his problem. I looked at this guy and I thought, he's got something. <laughs> And I looked at this guy and said, he's an idiot. <laughs> but, but that didn't prevent me from hitching my wagon to him for the next 25 years. So who's the idiot now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it actually wasn't that simple. That was how we met, but not how we got together as partners. Cut to a few months later, summer break. I was working as an intern at a talent agency in Los Angeles. Coming from New York by way of Madison, I had no idea how important, how important cars were in LA. Here's a tip for any badger thinking of moving there. They're very important. Anyway, I was taking the bus to work, a nearly two hour ride from my friend's couch in Venice. When I stepped off and walked toward the office building, I heard a car honk. I looked up and it was Eddie. I was working as a production assistant and making deliveries for a TV movie, and I was lost. So blind luck or fate or badger destiny, whatever you want to call it, had me stop at a traffic light as Adam got off the bus. I immediately pulled over and asked for directions. I was getting off a bus. I had no clue where to send him. And, and there we were, two incredibly naive badgers lost in LA, randomly running into each other in a city of millions. If that's not a sign, I don't know what is. Somehow it all seemed meant to be, and our partnership was born. We moved back to Madison for our last two years of school and started working together in earnest to begin our careers. They say in Hollywood, where you start can tell you so much about who you are and who you will become. Quentin Tarantino reinvented independent cinema with his debut, Reservoir Dogs. Damien Chazelle came roaring out the gate with Whiplash. Orson Welles started with Citizen Kane. Eddie and Adam, we started with a public access cable show on Madison Station WYOU called Hot Tonight. Someone in the Com Arts Department saw how passionate we were about making film and television and helped us secure a half hour a week on public access, which we have no idea if it still exists, but today is probably the equivalent of creating a web series. 
Yeah, there weren't many awards, but it did actually air briefly and involved some awful attempts at sketch comedy using sponsors like Parthenon Yeros and Rocky Rococo, Rocky Rococo Pizza. Are they still around? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Anyway, it was a less than auspicious beginning, and we didn't win any Emmys, but we did get some free slices of pizza. Yeah, we did. But, but more importantly, it allowed us to bring our imagi imagination to life for the very first time. Insane as it sounds, it filled us with a crazy belief that we could take this show on the road. From Parthenon Euros, the next stop was obvious, Hollywood, California. The following 25 years were quite eventful. After graduation, we moved to Hollywood, took whatever jobs we could, hoping to learn everything and anything. I was an assistant to movie producers, Joel Silver and Scott Rudin. Adam was a production assistant on shows like Tales from the Crypt. No task was too small. Didn't matter if it was picking up dry cleaning, delivering scripts, or bailing someone's kid out of jail. Yeah, really, that happened. <laughs> it didn't matter, we were in Hollywood, we were learning. And all the while, we were writing at night and weekends until we got our first big break writing for ABC on a short-lived remake of Fantasy Island. Yes, it was six short months, but it got us started writing television. The next decade, we spent going from show to show, learning what we could from incredible mentors until we spent six seasons writing and producing Lost. And then we wrote the movie Tron Legacy, and from there, created Once Upon a Time. So what could two guys who spent years writing crazy stories about smoke monsters on an island, dwarfs hatching from eggs, malevolent computer programs bent on destroying the world, possibly have to offer on this really special and incredibly, actually, mild day? Yeah, we thought it'd be cold, yeah. so we wrote cold. But it's yeah. not so bad. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's what everyone tells us. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's when it occurred to us exactly what to do. Back out. Turn it down. Tell them we couldn't do it. But before we could inform Chancellor Blank of the grave mistake the senior officers, the senior class officers had made in their selection of speakers, something occurred to us. Perhaps there was something we had to offer. Maybe, just maybe, the storytelling process itself might be relevant. You see, most of the time in television, stories are constructed in a room jammed full of writers that is called, of all things, a writer's room. Yeah, yeah, you'd think writers could come up with something a bit more clever, but that's it the writer's room. And inside, a few rules have emerged, and we thought we'd share them with you today. Rule number one, don't be a hollow bunny. In the writer's room, we have a saying, beware of hollow bunnies. You know how at Easter there are two kind of chocolate bunnies? They both look great, but one when you bite into, it crumbles, and it falls apart because it's hollow. It turns out it's cheap. It just looked good. The other one was solid through and through. Well, similar concepts apply to storytelling. For example, when we were coming up with the idea of Once Upon a Time, we knew we wanted to take classic fairy tales and bring them into the real world. But that meant these characters couldn't be one-dimensional cartoons. They had to feel like real people. In the animated movie Snow White, the evil queen wanted to kill Snow because a mirror said she was prettier than her. Pretty shallow, right? That's a hollow bunny. We needed to make the queen real, so we created a history for her filled with love and loss and regret and betrayal, and instead of being superficially jealous over her stepdaughter's beauty, we had Snow White destroy the queen's life by betraying her trust as a child. Now both were culpable. Now it was complicated. Now we had something, a solid bunny. As we discovered this storytelling truth, we realized it applied much beyond writing. Look inward. Why do you want what you want? What's important to you? Leaving college with a diploma and getting a successful job is great, but it's not enough. Experience life. Be well-rounded. Career and money aren't everything. Success doesn't mean you're interesting. Or more importantly, fulfilled. Characters in movies and television shouldn't be one-dimensional, and neither should you. Don't be a hollow bunny. Rule number two, don't be afraid to tear down the board. In writers' rooms, stories are carefully and meticulously constructed moment by moment on big dry erase boards that surround the room. It can take weeks or months to do it. So oftentimes, you become precious with your work. When writing the pilot of Once Upon a Time, for example, we had what we thought was an amazing opening sequence where characters in the enchanted forest were consumed by a terrible curse from the evil queen and banished to the worst place in the universe. Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. We have nothing but respect for our Buckeye brother. And no, we don't. We hate him, and we'll get him next year. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll get the Hurricanes next week. Go Badgers! <laughs> yes. 
Anyway, so the <laughs> that was a different version of the pilot that did not air, but, but we probably should have gone that way. In our version, the curse took them to our world, the one place where evil can win. They were trapped in a dreary town, but now we had a problem. We couldn't figure out where our story went from there. It started great, but then fizzled out. We banged our heads against the wall for ages. Until we realized the curse swallowing our characters wasn't the beginning of the story, it was the end. We had loved our opening so much that we were afraid to start over. But once we tore down the board and did start over, the real story presented itself to us. We had to build to that awesome scene. We had to open our minds to new ideas and new possibilities. Don't be afraid to tear down the board. Don't settle. Life will present you with many paths. Don't be afraid to start over if one is a dead end. You may feel like you invested so much time and energy going in one direction that it feels like a waste to undo your hard work. It's not. Every moment, every choice, every misstep, every mistake prepares you for the next one. But most importantly, that means keeping an open mind. It's easy to get locked into one way of thinking. Divorce yourself of that and the world will open up to you. And if you do that, you will never stop learning. We've been writing together for 25 years, and we still start every project with the same goal, learning something new and getting better. And we try to apply that to every area in our life. Your time in school may be over, but your education is just beginning. Rule number three, avoid typecasting. What is typecasting? It's a phenomenon, usually with actors, where a performer almost always plays the same kind of part. Think Brian Cranston. Years and years as the wacky dad on Malcolm in the Middle, then all of a sudden he's cooking meth in a trailer on Breaking Bad. He broke out of typecasting. Writers experience this too. Early in our careers, we were typecast. We spent two wonderful years writing on a show called Popular. It was a high school show about young people and their relationships coming of age. From there, we spent a year writing a show called Felicity, a show about young people and their relationships coming of age. From there, we wrote an episode of One Tree Hill, a show about young people coming, I, I think you get the idea. And the truth was, we were sick of it. We were bored. We weren't really writing the things that we wanted to write because we were afraid to. Don't let fear stop you. The problem wasn't our abilities, it was our fear. One of our mentors, Carlton Cues, gave us this advice. He said that while we were quite good at writing these shows, we were writing the wrong thing. We should be doing the things we love. We had found an easy and safe path, and we were sticking to it. Once we decided to look inward and ask what kinds of stories we really wanted to tell, it opened incredible doors for us. We went to work on Lost, and we were terrified. It was far different than anything we had ever done, which is exactly why we had to try it. And ultimately, it led to one of the most rewarding experiences in our career. We quickly learned that we had been held back by typecasting. But it wasn't the business that did it, it was ourselves. We didn't believe we could write something like Lost or Tron or Once Upon a Time, so we didn't try. But when we did, everything changed. Don't typecast yourself. Be the kind of person you want to be. So start there. If you don't believe in yourself and what you can do, no one else will. Rule number four, it's the journey, not the destination. In episodic television, in success, you're telling 100 or more stories. Where the story ends is far less important than how you get there. On a superficial level, yes, audiences want to know answers. Why is there a polar bear on the island? But the truth is, most of these questions can be answered with simple yeses or noes, or a few sentences of explanation. If you're going to ask an audience to stay with you for years, you have to give them something more. They're with you for the experience, for the ride. That's what matters. You didn't go to college counting every day until this ceremony. When you came here, did you only think about graduation, getting this diploma, listening to this speech? <laughs> we sure hope not, and we, and we suspect not. Think about your favorite moments in Madison. That's what awaits you. Where you end up is not the point. Life is full of moments on the way to wherever you go. Live in those moments because you don't know where you're going to end up, and that's okay. Our journey since Madison has been filled with ups and downs, lefts and rights, unexpected twists and turns, and not just on the page or screen, but in our personal lives and with our families. Remember that goals are important, but each moment we take on that journey um, to the goal is equally, if not more, important. You're about to leave this place that is quite wonderful. Where you go next is a mystery, but embrace that. Don't concern yourself as much with what lies at the end of the road, because hopefully that's a long way off. The last four years are a microcosm of what's to come. 
All the fun and achievements and setbacks and reversals of fortune that you experienced, that's the excitement and drama we try to capture on the screen. But it's in your life every day. Don't run away from it. Embrace it, live it, use it. Whether it appears success or failure is imminent doesn't matter. You're building something. It's like in the writer's room. We build our stories piece by piece, moment by moment. Your future is no different. Believe it or not, only believe it or not, you have far more control. We're limited by budgets and audiences and ratings and box office, but in life you're only limited by yourself, which is to say you have no limits. So that's it. That's our wisdom. Go out there and find a story. Find your story. Live it every day and know that no matter what happens, it will be uniquely yours. Make it what you want and don't stop until it is. Congratulations, class of 2017, and on, on Wisconsin! Wisconsin.